Welcome, my friends. 2020 has been an insane year, for better and for worse. Mostly for the worse outside of the game. But in terms of combat, we've been through some crazy changes, both big and small. I thought it would be fun to go back throughout the past year and check out all the various power creep, just to document the progression of combat from the beginning of the year to the end. So, let's get started. Let's start with War's Retreat, which may seem strange since it was focused primarily on quality of life first and foremost. The adrenaline crystals here provide you with adrenaline at a rapid pace, getting you to 100% and off you go to whatever boss you want to go. But here's the thing, this can still be useful regardless for preparation. Some special attacks last upwards to a full minute, which is enough to make use of it at most bosses. Melee gets the most use out of this with Dragon Battle X right before fights, which can help quite a bit, most notably for Telos and Solak, where you can quickly use your Battle Axe spec and enter the fight real quickly. There's also other neat stuff like Staff of Light inside of SSF Finality before going in to take far less melee damage, but this is incredibly niche and only super good for pushing Telos and Rage. With this, you'll take 50% less damage from melee hits for a full minute, and considering something like 4000% Telos hurts a ton, this is a perfectly viable thing you can do to make your push to 4000% much less deadly. Speed kills also change quite a bit by making setups a lot easier to pull off for faster times. Instead of always needing to set up outside with a combat dummy, you can get enough adrenaline after doing stuff like stalling incendiary shot, then release to natural instinct or however you need for the perfect setup. This doesn't really affect normal kills, but this was a godsend for speed kills and it leads to more insane setups that allowed more bosses to be one tick or just annihilated even quicker. There's a ton of crazy speed kills, but for the sake of brevity, I will use Pup's 7 second Hellware kill as an example here. Right when the video starts, he uses the Dragon Battle Axe special attack and builds back to 100%, then stalls incendiary shot on a nearby dummy with max hit mode on. Then he builds back to 100% and runs over to the dummy. He immediately releases it with a fast bow, in this case, Seeker Cole, and uses a random ability to reset his auto attack cooldown and to wait for incendiary shot to give the buff. Natural Instinct with Dark Bow auto attacks immediately takes him to an insanely high adrenaline, and the Greater Fury critical hit gets him back to full adrenaline and guarantees he'll crit his next ability to get even more guaranteed adrenaline that way after the fact. Then he quickly enters the Hellware portal with Surgeon Blade Dive and immediately uses Berserk and builds Adrenaline with defenses. And then this continues on until Hellware spawns, then he executes his rotation involving many special attacks. There's more to the speed kill after that, but War's Retreat completely changed how kills are set up now. Instead of needing to spend time outside the instance to waste precious natural instinct and incendiary shot buff time just building to our desired state, we can now just have much less RNG for these setups and get more speed attempts more frequently and more reliably. Again, this is not too relevant for normal farming kills for money, which would only extend as far as using Dragon Battle Axe or in rare instances Staff of Light, but speed kills have undeniably changed a ton thanks to War's Retreat. Beyond that, it provided some nice quality of life to make getting back into combat and such smoother and quicker. With only 10 total boss kills, you're able to teleport to War's Retreat instantly without any runes or other items needed right next to a bank and altar, which beats out the previous best banking method, Memory Strands, by being able to be used mid-combat and without opening up another interface. In addition, the shop allowed players to purchase quite a few things from it, namely life and aura refreshers. These don't directly impact kill speeds, but allows more people to do more PVN as Marks of War, the currency to buy these things, comes passively with killing bosses. So more bosses killed means more Marks of War, which means you can reset your auras or your sign of life more, so you can do a lot more PVM. Plus, some of the best auras in the game now come from this shop, like Berserker Auras, which removes needing to be a member for months before managing to buy these auras. That way, new accounts or players can be PVM ready at a much quicker time than before. Minor buffs weren't too prominent in 2020, but they still happened. Intercept and Vulnerability Bombs both received updates that let you cast them again even if the effect was already applied. Previously, you would have to wait until they wore off to apply it again, but now you are able to refresh them whenever you want with no restrictions. And another minor buff to Spiritualized Food, now known as Spiritualized Healing, made it so you no longer required needing another piece of food, 
and you can now buff the familiar duration beyond the maximum duration, which makes it pretty neat for extending pouches beyond their original max duration. Not a super noticeable power creep, but it's pretty nice if you want to do stuff like conserve pouches as an Iron Man or something. But a big one was the ability to quickly reset adrenaline potion cooldowns by simply interacting with the crystals at War's Retreat, which is added later on after the fact. This isn't traditional power creep in terms of actually fighting the boss, but this quality of life change did help push up kills per hour at certain places by letting you use adrenaline potions more liberally across the fight, especially if the most efficient way to kill requires an adrenaline potion right at the end. A good example is here at Telos, where I will use an adrenaline potion right here and then quickly finish the kill. Without the crystals resetting the cooldown, I would either have to wait a long time or do the final part of P4 with much less room to breathe. So that's pretty neat. Alright, Archaeology was a massive, massive game changer and requires a deep dive. We'll break it down into four categories. Relics, New Weapons, Ancient Invention, and Ancient Summoning. Relics are pretty straightforward. They're permanent, passive buffs that apply everywhere with caps in place to prevent degenerate combos and such. For combat, we have quite a list of relics. Fear of the Small, Berserker's Fury, Font of Life, Conservation of Energy, Heightened Senses, Persistent Rage, and more. On release, the best in slot setup was Berserker's Fury, Fury of the Small, and Font of Life. Font of Life was disposable while it was very minor and it was just a leftover relic as other potentially good relics used to cost too much to slot in with the other two. So it was fine to swap out Font of Life for something else like Divine Conversion for nice Divination AFK or whatever else. But Berserker's Fury and especially Fury of the Small are quite big. Berserker's Fury gives a damage boost that scales up the lower your life points are, up to 5.5%. Naturally, this encourages players to play more recklessly in order to eke out more damage, but that extra bit of damage does help quite a bit. Meanwhile, Fury of the Small permanently changes rotations by giving a ton of extra adrenaline over the course of a full rotation, allowing for more threshold and special attack usage. Adrenaline is at a constant premium, so any increase to Adrenaline massively changes how these bosses are approached on almost all affronts. Melee and range especially benefit from this, considering how Adrenaline hungry juggling their damage boosting ultimates and Zero's Godsword or LH Cross with special attacks are. With the release of Orth and Digside not too long ago, the options with Relics opened up. Instead of Font of Life, now you can add in more stuff like Persistent Rage for easy adrenaline stalling, Death Ward for extra damage reduction making Berserker's Fury easier to utilize, or something like Slayer Introspection to make certain Slayer tasks longer or shorter depending if you want money, XP, Slayer points, or any of the above. All these are pretty self-explanatory, but being able to add more relics with Orthan definitely help push power creep even further. Recently, Heightened Senses has been introduced in certain metas like melee and range cells to open up enough options to outweigh the damage bonus. A good example is right here for Telos, where without that extra adrenaline, you can't use Saren Gabo spec and rapid fire without also resorting to Limitless or Natural Instinct or Hydrix Bolt procs before those two abilities. Then it allows for even more adrenaline budget for P2 and P3. And since P4 and P5 and even P1 are effectively time gated, the extra damage boost from Berserker's Fury doesn't benefit much at all. This is one example that's far more clear cut though, and other situations require more research and testing to see if Berserker's Fury or Heightened Senses is better, at least for ranged. We also got new weapons of Archaeology, the Inquisitor Staff and the Masterwork Spear of Annihilation. Inquisitor is basically just the magic version of Hexhunter and Terrasome Maul, only this time Inquisitor can benefit at almost every high-end boss, except for Elite Dungeons and Yakamaru, which replaces the Staff of Sliske for high-level PVM. While Hexhunter is completely outclassed by crossbows with criminal bolts, and Terrasome Maul doesn't always work across an entire boss to camp effectively, like Araxor, Inquisitor doesn't have those problems. Generally, when it works, it will also work on the boss minions, like Telos Golems, Solak Glims and Roots, although it doesn't work on the Storm, and Virago Scopulus and Vitalis. But the Masterwork Spear was an even bigger boost to melee, increasing the duration of Dismember, Slaughter, and Blood Tendrils. This reintroduced Blood Tendrils as a great threshold to use and made both Dismember and Slaughter even better. Naturally, this is a big boost to damage, and one might argue even better than Inquisitor or Terrasol Maul. These abilities are so good, even using them inside a Berserk or ZDS spec is not as bad anymore, 
although you should of course aim to use them outside of those damage boosting abilities. Next is Ancient Invention, and this is pretty straightforward. Nearly all pre-existing perks that aren't single rank like Mobile or Planet Feet can go up by another rank. Precise 5 became Precise 6, Enhanced Devoted 3 became 4, so on and so forth. But this also made certain combination perks possible, allowing for more perks to be added to setups. Beforehand, if you want to get something like Impatient 3 plus Mobile, it would have been extremely expensive and not worth the cost. Stuff like Binding 3 was also only possible by itself, but now you're able to get even more crazy combos like Binding 4 plus X Slayer, meaning stuff like Dragon Slayer, Demon Slayer, Undead Slayer, or Binding 4 plus Mobile, etc. Impatient 4 combos actually became viable to go for as well, and of course, Enhanced Devoted 4 is always going to be incredibly powerful. And speaking of combos, it also meant changes to how weapon perks were laid out. Aftershock is one of the best weapon perks in the game, but unequipping any weapon with Aftershock on it resets stacks and you have to build it up again. So we put Aftershock 3 on main hand to never have to worry about losing stacks, and put Precise 4 Equilibrium 2 on off hand for that extra damage. The few problems with this setup were that shields, not defenders, had no precise or equilibrium boosts, and flanking didn't benefit from any of that stuff so that relative boost was not as high as a seed, even though still good boost and the loss is very minimal at best. All that changed by introducing aftershock on both main hand and off hand. Main hand swapped to precise 6 plus aftershock 1, letting you keep stacks while using a shield or flanking switch and getting the big precise boost while offhand got aftershock 4 plus equilibrium 2. And since you'll switch back to your offhand pretty quickly to benefit from aftershock 4 pretty frequently, it wasn't too frequent to have your aftershock go off when you're using a shield or flanking. Ancient Invention also gave us two new perks for combat, Relentless and Ruthless. Relentless has a chance of saving adrenaline on any threshold, special attack, or even ability with a 30 second cooldown, and the highest rank, Relentless 5, can be paired very easily with Crackling 4. So it's basically the only Crackling combo you really need for bosses. In theory, it sounds really strong, but Relentless doesn't proc a lot, and there will be many times where you simply cannot use the adrenaline because it proc at the wrong time. But when you do get it at the right time, your rotations can easily change for the better, as long as you can make full use of it. So if you can't really use the adrenaline at the right time, it's basically worthless. But still good enough for a nice quality of life. Ruthless buffs your damage after killing enemies, and it stacks up to 5 times. At full stacks with Ruthless 3, it's one of the best damage boosts, matching even Precise 6 and beating out Aftershock. However, this has limited use in boss encounters because not many bosses will always have minions or other enemies to kill as part of the meta. At Telus, for example, you completely ignore all the go-ups and just kill Telus before anything kills you. Any golem killing is purely on accident. But it shines elsewhere, like at Solak where you kill limbs and roots, or at Elite Dungeons where you're constantly cleaning out trash mobs, snowballing into more damage, stuff like that. It's a bit limited, but it works really well in places where you can kill multiple mobs at once. Finally, we come to summoning, which is incredibly insane as a whole, solely because of the Ripper Demon. This familiar does so much damage, up to 60k damage per minute if spamming the spec constantly, and even boosts your own damage that scales the lower your enemy's health is, up to a maximum of 5%. Even after a massive nerf a month later, it's still extremely powerful. Steel Titans instantly became obsolete, and Night Hills diminished in use as well. Night Hills still have use when Rippers can't do direct damage like at Virago or Rise of the Six, but if Familiars can directly hit the boss, Rippers will always remain the best Familiar unless you need a Mammoth. We also got Calgarian Demons and their scroll that boosts critical hit chance by 5% for everyone near the Demon including the Caster, but it's really only used for Araxor or certain speed kills because you don't need the accuracy boost from Nihils and the damage boost from Rippers are still inferior to Calgarian Scrolls. Not to mention, the boosts from Calgarians are too unwieldy and aren't intuitive at all because it uses the southwest square to determine where people can get buffed by the demon. But even if that problem was solved, there's currently no scenario where using Calgarian demons in a group encounter mathematically outweighs simply using a ripper demon of your own. Archaeology was a bombshell of an update, so let's scale back with something else. Power Burst, released the previous year in 2019, 
had potential but shared cooldowns with adrenaline potions, so they were extremely limited in practice. They either needed to have stronger effects or be unlinked from adrenaline potions. And Jagus chose the latter so he can use adrenaline potions on top of power bursts now. For combat, two power bursts rose to the forefront, Acceleration and Vitality. Acceleration basically gives you unlimited charges on blade dive and surge for 6 seconds, giving unparalleled mobility. This shines the most when doing elite dungeons, which can really cut down on the running if you use it correctly. Otherwise, it's alright when you're using clues, but in terms of combat potential, it only has really good use at elite dungeons. Vitality is pretty cool though. It doubles both your current health and max health for 6 seconds, and after it wears off, they're halved again. But this is effectively 50% damage reduction in a can, which is really nice for tanking stuff you normally can't tank but would make it way easier to DPS through, like Rapture Rocks or Telos Auto Attacks. Be warned, however, as your effective healing is also half since you heal normally, then your health will be halved after that. So you need to be careful using it if you're gonna eat food in the middle of it. But now here's another absolute game changer, the Essence of Finality. This amulet is ungodly powerful with even higher stats than the Amulet of Souls, combining both the Amulet of Souls passive with the Reaper Necklace passive, and to cap it all off, another effect that can consume special attack weapons and let you use that special attack with the current weapons you're using with no other restriction. This means something like Dark Bow is no longer tied to your tier 70 shield bow, but can now be used with tier 92 weapons, and because of those restrictions being completely lifted, stuff like Dark Bow becomes extremely powerful and absolutely worth using inside a rotation, even despite its massive adrenaline cost. Even just the combined Amulet of Souls and Reaper and Necklace effect was strong enough, since you no longer need to give up in survivability using a Reaper with Necklace, but the special attack perk makes it even more powerful. But being able to use special attack weapons with little other restrictions opens up so many options. That said, most special attacks aren't boosted in super interesting ways beyond just more damage. For example, you don't use Gothic Staff any differently from before Essence of Finality was a thing. Stacia's Warhammer can be used without breaking the bank as much, since using the special attack inside an Essence of Finality doesn't degrade the amulet like it does for the weapon, but it doesn't really affect actual kill speed. Stuff like Dark Bow are few and far between in terms of actually mixing inside rotations, like Dragon Claws. Fortunately, we have just the perfect spec that is completely transformed with Essence of Finality. To give another idea of what happens when you remove all limitations, there's no better special attack than the Saren Gabo to demonstrate. One such example is Chin SGB, where you can use mechanized Chin Chapas on a group of smaller enemies underneath a larger enemy. Because SGB arrows hit other targets if they miss the original target, they can land on said large enemy, causing this massive hailstorm that utterly decimates it. It's pretty good, to say the least. Then we have interactions with Bacrino Bolts, namely Ruby Bolts. Now that bolts can be used with SGB spec, this opens the door for even more damage, and SGB spec mixed in with ruby bolts causes some real carnage. It also basically speaks for itself. There's more special attacks that Essence of Finality makes even better, which could also be its own video to really dive deep into. But in short, Essence of Finality is up there as one of the single biggest power creep we've ever seen just from one single update, which is very very insane to see. Finally, we have our last bit of huge power creep, introduced with our newest boss in the game, Raksha. That said, only Greater Rakshia is worth a deeper dive in, as the rest are either too niche or not super exciting. Diver is basically resonance, but instead of healing, you gain adrenaline. This might have some neat usage as an offensive defensive playstyle, but as sustain through resonance is too good and adrenaline is already super high, this has limited use cases. Even now I struggle to immediately think of good places to use it, beyond one niche case, using Divert to Berserk to Greater Barge and hope you get the adrenaline boost after Berserk goes off, but that's not always reliable, it's probably not super good either, a minor boost at best. It's definitely a neat ability, but the sustain from Resonance is just way too good when you actually need to block a hit instead of just going full tank and spank. The potential definitely exists however, and I'm willing to give it a chance to see where it can be smartly utilized. Similarly, Greater Chain is also neat but definitely has some usage in something like Slayer than actual combat, mainly because magic is just that much weaker than melee and ranged, even when you account for AoEs. What it does is that it adds another hit at 50% strength of the ability you next used on the targets you initially hit with Chain. 
It sounds nice, but in terms of AoE, melee and range just haven't beaten in most relevant places where AoE is needed. There exists a way to get a double boost with Chain and another AoE hit, but it's incredibly hard to do and isn't going to be strong enough to warrant jumping through multiple hoops. Then we have Fleeting Boots, which provide some neat quality of life with rapid fire allowing movement mid-channel. That added flexibility can definitely help and in some cases like Telos, completely change how to approach it, but it's still not super game changing. But Greater Ricochet is absolutely busted. When I initially talked about Ruthless with Archaeology, I mentioned how it has limited uses in bosses due to little minions or not needing to kill them as part of the meta. But this time, those scenarios actually work to our favor. Greater Ricochet adds extra hits at 50% strength on your main target if there are no other targets around your main target. This means you immediately get a 200% basic ability right away with a low cooldown and can pierce through hitcaps pretty easily like at Nex or QBD. But then you slap on Karomi 4, it all snowballs to add 4 more 500% hits, totaling to 400% damage. For reference, it utterly demolishes Bombardment and Type Bindings and even matches and surpasses Snapshot. That's better than a ton of thresholds. And since it's multiple hit splats, it has very good synergy with other tools like Soul Split, Special Ammunition, and Elder's Crossbow. Since Soul Split has diminishing returns larger than hit splat, and Greater Ricochet is 7 individual hit splats, Soul Split would not suffer under these diminishing returns as much. This means you'd heal a ton with Greater Ricochet compared to other abilities. And since Elder Spec works off those Soul Split heals, that makes Elder Spec even more suited for Greater Ricochet in hitting really, really high. I mean, look at this damage. And that's still not all, because we haven't even gotten to special ammunition like Hydrox Bolt and Blackstone Arrows. And since there are 7 rolls for a Hydrox proc, that effectively means you have a 66% chance of getting at least one Hydrox proc, massively boosting your adrenaline in an instant. And if you get lucky with procs, it can easily be way better. And then you have Blacks and Arrows, which drain the target's armor and last for 12 minutes, or the target becomes a completely different NPC like Telos P4 to P5. They are not an Infinity debuff, despite using similar graphics, so Infinity debuffs and Blacks and Arrows actually do stack. Beforehand, this would have taken a long time to apply, and even then you would only really need one stasis Warhammer spec to do the job for most bosses, so they went unused except for slower Harmo Virago duos. But with Greater Ricochet, you can apply up to 7 blocks on arrows with Greater Ricochet instantly and cut out time spent using blocks on arrows and spend more time using criminal bolts, leading to more damage. So yeah, Greater Ricochet is incredibly powerful and pushes his range over the edge as the overall best combat style in the game currently. Personally, I think this has a very high chance of getting nerfed, as it's incredibly close or even better than thresholds like Snapshot as a basic ability with very little drawbacks. Even something like Bleeds and Flanking have drawbacks compared to this. It's never too late to nerf things down the line as Jagus has a long history of taking a long time to nerf things. I mean, Ripper Demon was obviously busted, but it still took over a month to nerf with heads up, so that stuff takes time. That said, if a nerf happens, I will definitely investigate and make a video on it. That covers all the power creep that has pushed combat forward in 2020. There are other updates like Araxor Path 3 getting shorter and Solak scaling, but those aren't explicitly power creep. They're just updates to smooth out old content. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is just a start of more regular videos where I have a topic I want to discuss and share. I have many ideas about what to do, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for all future content. Until next time, everybody, bye.